We're going to talk about the information network. The information network is phase two of Digital's uh, software um, framework for managing data in a multi vendor environment. Uh, you don't have any slides in your handouts, and you won't be able to copy these off the network for a couple of reasons. The first reason is it contains features from about five years out. Second is we haven't finished putting the presentation together. So therefore, there are some, some things in here we would like to see changed. And rather than giving copies out to everybody so they can go out and use them and talk about things that are still five years out, we decided maybe it would be better if we didn't do things like that. So we're going to talk about what problem we're going to try to solve with the information network so that uh, we can get a feel for exactly uh, why we want to, uh, to spend uh, all of digital's money trying to do these wonderful things for our customers. If you look at what the customers um, are doing, what they want to do is be able to take uh, all the data that they have now and integrate it all into one single environment. Um, and if you look at what's out there today, the pressures of competition, you know, in the database arena in particular, there's great competition in the BMS environment, uh, even outside the BMS environment. Users, cost, regulatory actions, anything. Uh, what our customers are telling us as we go out and talk to them constantly is that they want to treat all of this data as if it is one piece of data. And they don't care what it's stored in, or how it's stored, or what it looks like, or what it feels like, or what it smells like. They want to be able to get to it so that their customers can make decisions um, on, on the information that they need. And they don't even care if it's on an IBM machine, an HP machine, a Sun machine, or a VMS machine, or a Unix machine, or any other machine. They just want to be able to get to the data uh, and, uh, and work on it as if it was uh, just one database. So if you look at developing distributed heterogeneous environments today, uh, what you have to look at is a, a number of, of requirements uh, that you have to have people who understand it in uh, different areas. For example, right, operating systems, communications, uh, transaction services such as uh, two-phase commit protocols. Uh, you need to have people who understand the application development environment for developing app uh, applications in a distributed heterogeneous environment. Uh, you need people who have to understand uh, Data, data location, so we can do maintenance on data, backups, uh, restores in case of a failure, or something like that. Understand uh, application environments, understand data structures, understand everything about it, and in, to, in order to be able to build such an environment like this, it's a tremendous amount of, of knowledge has to be out there. And what we're hoping to do with the information network is to shrink down this set of, of knowledge to a smaller, uh, more manageable subset. During DeckWorld, we took a, uh, an unscientific poll, if I may say. Uh, we went by and said, excuse me, you're a customer. Uh, can you answer a couple of questions for us? Uh, and to get a feel for what our environment our customers are working in. And what we found is that 90% of them have three or more operating systems. That 50% of them have been involved in some kind of merger or acquisition. And that's really interesting because if you have two companies, one is, has all their information on digital, one has all their information on IBM, they, one acquires the other, how do you take all this data and put it together? 65% okay. of them have multinational operations, and 50% of them network with their customers or suppliers. That is, if you look at uh, how Exxon who buys great numbers of, of, of um, who have a large number of customers who actually buy uh, their products, they actually have an environment where it's kind of like an ATM. You can put your card in and make payments to them. Okay, and that's directly hooked up with their suppliers. And so what we have found is that 50% of them are in that environment. So how are we going to go about building an information network that can take, a, uh, that can take advantage and, and integrate all of these different uh, uh, environments so that we can uh, be an integrated, integrated solution player? Well, our vision is to provide a set of products uh, which will allow information belonging to an enterprise to be accessed uniformly, efficiently, and securely for competitive advantage by uh, any authorized user of the enterprise, regardless of where they're at, uh, what, uh, what, what they have. They may be sitting on Macintosh, they may be on a 3270 off of an IBM, it doesn't really matter where. Uh, where they're located, whether they're here, they're in Australia, France, or in, uh, in uh, uh, Greenland. And uh, they don't care about whether they're running TCP, IP, 
whether they're on a uh, deck net or anything else, so they're actually connected together. They want a, uh, a distributed system that can be able to provide the functionality. Realizing that that's what we want to do, the goals of the information network are to um, integrate existing and new files uh, in databases into a single uh, asset, information asset. We want to provide uniform client view of data. We want to be able to say that no matter where I am, anywhere else in the network, I can say, I need to get this data and I will always be presented in a uniform view, what I'm used to seeing. Provide a solid architecture framework for uh, future extensibility so that we can extend to uh, other types of environments, for example, object-oriented environments or uh, knowledge-based environments. Basically to provide an inherently distributed functions and services in a heterogeneous computing environment. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. How are we going to go about doing this? <clears throat> well, if you look at the, uh, the NAS services, um, uh, network application services, we are, we, the information net, uh, network is the, the data component of that environment. Uh, the environment uh, talks about common uh, APIs, it talks about all the services, whether it's application, user, system, but the data is what we're looking at primarily in, in the information network. In terms of standards, uh, there is a data access language, it's called ANSI and ISO SQL2. Uh, currently today, the SQL standard is called SQL89 or SQL1.1 or SQL1, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the, the, the one that's out for draft now is called SQL2, and that's what we're building our, the, uh, the uniform access language to. Uh, there's also something called the uh, RDA, the remote, database, uh, remote Data Access Standard, which talks about how, uh, a standard on how uh, different uh, Structures can talk to each other, and so it's, you know, it's going to come up with a two-phase commit protocol between multiple databases, which is a really interesting uh, problem in itself. There's also something called the SQL Access Consortium. Uh, it's a consortium of vendors uh, who have come together to say, you know, the standards process was working kind of slowly, and you know, it took you know six or seven years before the SQL standard came. It's out now and it really came out, and we need to move forward because our customers are telling us. We don't care about the database. We want to be able to access the data from a single application. And we don't have to want to program 13,000 uh, select statements to get to each one of our databases. Uh, so the SQL Access Consortium has got together and said, let's, let's devise a protocol that defines things as a client and a server and how to talk between the two. So a person could be a SQL Access server provider or a SQL Access client provider or both. And the protocols then can be used to talk to any type of database. Communications, um, the ISO OSI standards, DECnet Phase 5, and then TCP IP are the ones that we're planning on looking at uh, moving forward to. And the operating systems, the uh, XOpen, the System 5, uh, the POSIX and OSF1, as well as, well, those are standards, and of course, BMS and others as they come along. Very <coughs> committed in implementing the standards as they exist and drive those as they don't exist. Was SNA intentionally that? Well, SNA will theoretically be ISO compliant at some point in time. <clears throat> if you look at the information network, uh, there's a rollout. We're not going to just come out and say, ta da, here's all your products. Obviously, we can't do that, or it'll be a lot more than five years before we can get everything done. So, what we're doing is we're rolling out over three phases. The first phase is what's out there today. Uh, we have data managers, RDB VMS, there's Ultras SQL, Max DBMS, Objectivity DB, and you know, OO database. Uh, we have access to foreign databases through gateways. We have access to DB2, Oracle, RMS, VSAM, 9MS extractions, and desktop access to RDB through SQL services. The next phase, which is currently in development, is being able to fully integrate all of these data from multiple database managers uh, into a single uh, access from a common uh, API uh, with inherently distribu distributed equalities. That is, being able to say that I have some of my employees' database on this node and some of my employees' database on this node, and as a user, I don't care. I just say, give me these employees that I need to, to, to look at. Be able to get to the data that I want. And that this data be also portable. Uh, one of the biggest things that David Stone, our vice president, uh, has said is that he wants portability. We want to be able to move it to him. Uh, any, any operating system that we feel is important. And so the goal uh, in our development right now in the phase two is component portability. 
So that we can take any particular component and take that over to any other operating system that we desire to run on at that time. And then in phase three of this uh, is an architecture planning mode. Uh, what we're trying to do is try to integrate uh, non-relational data models into this total environment. Uh, models such as of active DBMS, which is a network on our database. How do we how do we do select statements that make DBMS understand what that means in terms of owners of members and set uh, criteria? And also um, advanced client access models. Uh, you may have something like C++ or um, ads. Ads is an application-driven uh, database software being able to work with multimedia uh, environments and how to make those uh, work through uniformly through the same common API. <clears throat> so if you look at the scope of the information network, you can really break it down into a, a multitude of things. Uh, you can break it down into uh, the APIs, and the phase one APIs are what exist today. The phase two uh, APIs, uh, application program or interfaces, uh, SQL two, uh, SQL services, and SQL access, and we have multiple client platforms uh, listed here, and these are the ones that we're commonly looking at now. But as you can see, with other, it can be anything you want that we decide to do on. The first platform will be Ultra uh, or OSF, uh, followed shortly by VMS. Um, so you can have actually clients being sitting on any of these environments, running any of uh, any of the phase two environment, doing any type of tool or application, and they can transparently access through the information network data that's located in any of the server platforms. Simultaneously, I may ask for data that I can get from both uh, a, a, a database from, on an OSF system as well as a VMS system, and as an application programmer, I just say, go get the data. And the, the information network itself provides that, those links to say, oh, I know that data is over here, and this data is over there, and so therefore, go get it for us. Uh, and then phase three, the later phases is, is with the, the C++, the ATS standards, to non-relational non and object-oriented type environments. <clears throat> so basically, if you look at the characteristics of what an information network uh, enterprise-wide database would be, uh, it would be distributed, that is, multiple sites with multiple clients, say a multi-client, multi-server environment, uh, where, the, where the location is totally independent uh, uh, in, in from the view of the, uh, the user. Uh, the data can be moved around. For example, there's uh, something called fragmentation, where I can actually uh, uh, have uh, take a part of partition of a database and say I want fragments at this location and that location, but this is my primary fragment that has to be con continually updated if updates go to it, and then the updates can be prop uh, propagated to the fragments. What the fragments do for you is to be able to say, you know, if I say, you know, I need to find this data, okay, it might be closer and faster, therefore, to retrieve it from one of the fragments than from the main primary uh, um, data structure itself. Uh, and so that's uh, one thing, where it doesn't matter where it is, as long as you can get to it. A heterogeneous, that means it has to be on multiple data managers uh, in transaction with multiple managers data, being able to access both DB2 and, and RDB data. And uniformly functional, that is, you will have an access path called SQL2, which will access all of your data. So you only have to learn one thing to be able to access everything. And you will have full SQL functionality for all the data. What you get as a result of, of developing an application like this is that if you remember the slide a few slides ago where we said, you know, if, if you were going to develop a distributed a heterogeneous environment, you would have to know all of these things when we were able to knock this down to a subset of those. We don't have to have, we still have to have people who understand operating systems, who understand communications, but it's not necessarily somebody who understands all the different environments that you can do development with. Okay. So there are, uh, uh, we actually do a lot of things in order, in order to be able to uh, um, made the environment uh, less um, get the work I'm trying to think of. Anyways, so the advantage of, of having a, an information network as in, that we've been describing is that we can incorporate multiple data managers into a single distributed environment. We can integrate data from heterogeneous computing platforms. We uh, have a uh, on a, an environment which is inherently distributed, it is uh, provides for an enterprise uh, system management, uh, so that you have, a, a, you can have you get all your system management from a single site, uh, or not, depending on which way you want to do it. It's integrated with NAS, 
uh, for multi-vivid case in office environments so that it doesn't really matter uh, what type of application that you're running, it still is going to access uh, throughout the world. And the model extensibility for both the client and server, we can, we can extensively, we, we can ex uh, take the client and extend it and not necessarily have to do anything with the server. Uh, and the same thing with the server, not necessarily the client. So we have extensibility in both the client and the server. So what are some of the key concepts that are going to make this uh, come to fruition? I talk about all this wonderful pie in the sky stuff, and then you sit back and say, yeah, all right. And uh, you're going to do this how many years now? So let's talk about how we're going to go about some of the, the concepts. Well, the concept is that we want to provide the uniform application interface. That is, the SQL2 interface. We want to be able to work in both a federated and integrated distributed database environment. I'll talk about each of these separately. Uh, we want to have a, an architecture which both the client and the server are both distributed. Uh, we want to have a catalog. A catalog is this thing that tells us where everything is. So we go to the catalog and say, so where is everything that I need? And it says, well, here it is. Uh, we need to be able, ability to do distributed request compilation and execution so that when you say, I need this data, it may be better to send it to another place to get it uh, executed or compiled. So we have to be able to uh, distribute that. We have to be able to manage this environment. Doesn't do any sense uh, to uh, I'll come back in a second. Doesn't make any sense to not be able to manage this uh, from a single environment uh, if you need if you need it that way. And it's integrated with the cohesion environment. Yes. Is that dictionary? It's a type of dictionary. Yeah. If you look at conventional uh, programming interfaces now, there's generally a one-to-one -one mapping of, of between uh, the language you use and what you're trying to work with. Uh, for example, you can use Backsys QL to access RDB VMS databases. You can use DBQ to access back to DBMS databases. And you can use RMS or QIOs to access RMS data. Uh, you use Oracle's SQL to talk to Oracle. You use Ingress's SQL to talk to Ingress. And you can't use Oracle's SQL to talk to RDB. Again, what we're wanting to do is to provide the application developer and therefore the user the ability to write a single application through a uniform access called SQL2 into the dispersed portable <coughs> server environment, in this case to an RDB VMS database or a DB2 database or RMS uh, files directly. Um, again, this being a portable client environment and this being a portable server environment. If we look at federated and integrated database models, uh, basically a, a, a federated database is, is a heterogeneous database environment where things are connected. Each person has to do their own backups. Each person has to do it. It's, it's just as if they are all data managers of the, their own. And, it, and an integrated distributed database is a loosely coupled but all, it'd be all, an all a native, native data manager. It would be all one type of data manager. You would know how to do backups for that one data manager, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's really just the two types of database models that we're trying to uh, accomplish. In other words, if your customer is starting a brand new application, what they may want to do is start building it as a, a complete integrated distributed database environment. But if they already have applications up and running and they, and they want to be able to create another application that can access all of them, then they should be able to do it with, as a federated database. And so we want to be able to provide both types of data models. Distributed client server architecture. What we want to be able to do is say, you can put a client anywhere on the network. You can put a server anywhere on the network. And the network is, again, a heterogeneous environment. Uh, and you can get, and gain access to data, 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 given the fact that you have the, the ability to do it and it's secure in your environment. So therefore, I could be sitting on an application uh, here and actually getting data off of another completely box. Another complete box it could be an OS2 box, it could be any kind of box, and going to um, the existing data manager that's over there, or I could be sitting anywhere and uh, get to the native data manager. When I talk about the data, the uh, native data manager, I'm talking about the uh, the RDB star or the information network uh, data manager itself. An example, I may be sitting on um, an information client here on Macintosh. I issue a query that may need to go against data uh, in our new data, our new uh, native data manager. Uh, accessing data off of a non-digital 
through your SQL access or DB2, or uh, to an existing data manager such as Ultrix SQL or RDB BMS. And it doesn't matter because the application makes this completely transparent to the user and to the application programmer. All they have to do is, is build it to client that way. <coughs> the alternatives that you can actually do, uh, that you can actually uh, to build up into your environment, is you can have the client, the server, and all the data managers all in one single box. They'll all be on 99,000. Uh, you can break up the client and the servers on different boxes, but have all of your databases on a single box. You can have your client servers broken apart and your access to each of them, each of these, uh, each of the data managers on separate boxes. So I can actually be on one box and talking to three other boxes to get my data, four boxes. Or you can have it such that a client and a data, the native data manager is in one box and the other stuff is in another box. Okay, so there are multiple ways that you can configure an environment like this, and uh, this is what our customers are telling us that they're trying to accomplish today. <coughs> catalog. The catalog is, is really designed to manage um, uh, the, the database itself, knowledge of where the data is located, uh, so that the application itself doesn't have to understand that. So if we had to make some kind of movement of data from one physical box to another physical box or from some disk to another sub, 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 set of disks, uh, the catalog goes on and it really has to understand that. The applications don't uh, have to understand that. So a catalog has location of the data da native data manager, has location of existing data access points, that is to RDB VMS, to Ultrix SQL, to Oracle, RMS, whatever. A description of the native data, that is the metadata of it, and, the meta, and a copy of the metadata of the, other, the foreign data managers, so that each of the foreign data managers will have a copy of the metadata in their database, as well as a copy of that in the catalog. Uh, it will have user uh, access rights, and as well as your privilege to be able to gain access to that data. Uh, it is where we'll, com uh, where we'll have our stored procedures, our, our uh, pre-compiled data access procedures, all be stored in the catalog, so that if I have a, a um, a pre-compiled procedure out there, I can say, I want to execute this procedure, and it can go on and execute it. <clears throat> so, let's say that I'm sitting here on, on, this, on uh, this system over here, and I, I need to issue a request. Okay, what I do is I talk to the server, um, that's in my case, in this case, on my, my system here, the server runs through the compilation stage to produce a compiled module. But what this does is it goes out and it produces a, a top level plan on how I'm going to go get this data. And then it takes that top level plan and breaks it into multiple, uh, multiple pieces, uh, or what we call single service plans, for each execution site. So that in, in this case, if I was going to talk to all three of these data servers, okay, it would build a top level plan, then it would build three uh, single service plans. And uh, it would optimize the, uh, the shipping function. So if, if I'm working in a cluster, I can pass it across, um, I can pass it across the box as opposed to going through the network. But we, what we do is we, we optimize how we're going to pass these requests off to the servers, and the servers are actually what do the execution. And one of the greatest things that I think we put in the information network at this point is this thing called the helper service, which actually augments the functionality of the data manager that it's serving. So for example, um, let's say that uh, you're trying to, to update both a native data manager as well as a DB2 database. Okay? Well, we all know that the DB2 doesn't have the capability to do two-phase commit, but with helper services, we can kind of kind of trick DB2 into, into the thinking that it's doing two-phase commit because these helper servers, uh, these helper services, uh, can tell us how we can do things that may not nor normally uh, normally be known at the time of execution. So it's kind of like a, a little um, uh, server off to the side that says, oh, if you're accessing RMS, you need to keep these things under consideration. If you're accessing DB2, you need to keep these things under consideration. So it's really more than just a gateway. It's really, uh, it's really uh, um, arguments how, how we'd actually go out doing the data. From that point, we just execute and, uh, and grab the data that we need and bring it back. Do you have a query translation mechanism which actually translates the regular SQL 2 into that's correct. If, if, if there is some extension to SQL2 that we have in, in our in our API, then if DB2 hasn't 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 got that particular uh, uh, query uh, that particular 
feature in theirs, then we will commit, we will create something that that uh, that can do that. Uh, we actually do that today as well because you know there are some functions that uh, DB, that we have that db 2 doesn't have. But if you ask for them, we'll get the data and do it for you. But it's rather slow sometimes. <clears throat> Managing the information, uh, we're going to uh, follow the EMA integrated management model. Uh, it will be the command line or Windows interface. Uh, we will, uh, the uh, enterprise-wide management will be of the integrated distributed databases, uh, local management for federated, federated databases. What this says is that if it's a, the, the RDB star data manager or the native data manager, uh, we will provide uh, total um, support through the EMA model. If it's, low, if it's a federated distributed database, then each, lo each local side will have to be autonomous. They have to do their own backups and their own restores and everything else. Uh, one of the reasons why is that we don't understand how, some, you know, how, how, how their backups work and all that stuff, uh, nor do we really care. Uh, management of existing databases is unchanged by incorporation into the information network. If you're making changes to your database today, it doesn't matter, we don't care. You change them this way, you change them today, and that changes will be propagated as needed. So it doesn't really affect any, anything the way you're doing management of existing databases today just by putting the information network in there. It doesn't change what you're doing. Integration with cohesion. Um, <clears throat> we are going to be uh, putting uh, information uh, both in the catalog and the CD repository. Uh, that will give us the ability to do uh, 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 pieces tracking, versioning, be able to use CDD administrator to be able to administrate some of the information. Um, the ATIS uh, object model is a, is, a, is a model that's coming out as part of the standard for repositories uh, that uh, is basically an object-oriented model to talk about how you, how you manipulate metadata or data that's stored in a repository. And therefore, uh, we can, you know, it's also the, the repository can be extended by users so they can add their own particular uh, pieces in there, and that's you know that's what we're going to do in terms of integration with cohesion framework. So what are the components? I've talked about from a pretty high level what our goals are and why we're doing it this way. And then I got down to the next level and said, you know, these are these are the things that we're trying to accomplish and why. And now we're going to talk about the components that actually accomplish this. Um, the reason why we have the components broken out like this uh, is this is where our current thinking is in terms of how we're going to, to sell and position the products. Uh, if somebody wants to only have uh, SQL services clients, there's no reason to make them buy everything else. So what we have done is we've broken it into the database, distributed database of clients, which uh, is a command dispatcher and a SQL services server. Uh, the SQL services clients which has the uh, API for both SQL services, SQL access, and SQL con connectivity. Uh, SQL connectivity is, is a, another consortium of uh, Microsoft, Sybase, and Digital uh, that talk about you know, connectivity of, of, uh, of PCs to, to mainframes or PC data. It's being rolled up into the SQL access uh, consortium. The uh, distributed database servers, we have the clients, now we have the servers uh, for uh, the command executors, is what we call them. They're data managers, RDB PMS, DB2, uh, SQL Access, and uh, beyond that, uh, DBMS, RMS, and DSAM. Uh, uh, access servers for other data managers. Um, there, will be, there will be times uh, when they not necessarily want to buy a command ex uh, executor for an RDB PMS database. We don't know why, but there may be a reason why they don't want to do that. So we will provide some kind of, a, of gateway protocol between RDB PMS and DB2 and and the SQL access and others. Uh, the language of better processor preprocessor itself, this is kind of like what we have today with the, uh, the development environment. You divide the development environment, you get the preprocessors and everything you can go and develop your applications. Uh, and then the runtime comes with the operating system, so therefore you don't have to worry about that. Uh, it can, uh, contains the embedded language pr uh, processor, the module language processor, dynamic SQL2, and interactive SQL2, very similar to what we have today with RDB DMS. And then there's a database tools environment which has uh, RDB Expert, Deck Trace, and then the Director, which is uh, basically our database management utility for distributed databases. <coughs> so 
how do all these things to talk to each other? Well, they all talk to each other through a, um, a uniform access protocol. There's a, as you develop your application, you are using this protocol, to, uh, uh, which is called SQL2, to be able to develop your application. During execution, there's a, there's a, a common protocol between the application program and the command dispatcher. The command dispatcher is where we actually do the uh, topical compilation of a request. Then there's a, um, there's a uh, uniform uh, protocol between the command dispatcher and the, ex the executor, that is the thing that executes the compiled request. Uh, between command dispatcher and command dispatcher, uh, when the command dispatcher has done all this optimization on how it's going to get to the data, it passes it to another command dispatcher if, it's, if it needs to get data from another machine. So we have a protocol between the two command dispatchers, which is uniform, that is always going to be there. So we can pass between the two of them. And then we also have a protocol between the command dispatcher and the command ex executor for existing data managers such as RDB VMS and uh, and DB2 uh, in the SQL access. So we have, we have devised over the last few years this protocol mechanism so that we can talk to all the components as we need to talk to them. Now we've done some optimizations that if a couple of systems are in, in clusters or are in an SFD environment, that they don't have to go through this protocol. They go through a, 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 a little optimization protocol, but it's still a uniform protocol to talk between the uh, command executors. To uh, increase the performance of the environment. Two questions. One, the command dispatcher could be remote. I'm sorry, the command dispatcher is? Could be remote. The other command dispatcher could be in a remote system. Yes, remote. Okay. that's correct. Command dispatcher can be in the, the you know, host node and is on every node that the information network is running. Second question. Uh, is the client, uh, the, the main command dispatcher, responsible for integration, the integration of the data? Or is that another? The command dispatcher is responsible for, for uh, getting the data back and presenting it back into the application program. It all comes back. It's just back to the application. <coughs> In terms of the server itself, uh, the server is actually the built-in data storage uh, and management for the native distributed data manager. Uh, as well as the request preparation and execution. And access servers for other data managers is actually access to those data. It's actually access to the data, uh, but actually, um, and, and does the request preparation and execution. And if we're not gonna try and optimize uh, access to an Oracle database, we're gonna pass a request to an Oracle database and let them optimize access to their own database. The same thing is true with RDB VMS. Uh, in, in the, in, when, we, when we build our top of our single server plan, we pass that down to the, um, the, the data manager, in, this, in that case RDB VMS, and we'll let RDB's optimizer figure the best way to get to the physical data. For the data manager itself, we have our own optimizations to get to it. These servers, again, uh, the server platforms can be anything you desire to port to, because that would be a port portable part of the code. So we can actually port to an OSF, a VMS, uh, any Unix, or any other platform that we desire to work and we'll be able to get in access to uh, the different data managers. The native relational distributed data manager is basically, in, in this case, if you, if you look at um, how we have it built here, it's inher inherently distributed. Uh, it does compile time distributed request compilation, so therefore it can do the request compilation in any uh, command dispatcher because each of them know what the other knows. It's optimized for both online transaction processing and online complex processing. Another term for uh, decision support type environments. We like to see their stuff online. Uh, and it is enhanced relational data model. It is based on a relational model with some enhancements that we uh, to uh, for distributability. You know, if you look at SQL2, it has nothing about. It still has, knows nothing about distributed database. Absolutely nothing. And that's going to be the new standard in a year or so. So we had to put some extensible, um, we had to extend it so, so that we understand uh, what distributed model really means. Access to existing data, for, for example, RDB VMS databases, Ultra SQL, or any other ones, um, will be accessed using SQL2. Again, SQL2 is being our, our uniform protocol to all the different uh, data we can get to. It will be transparent, uh, heterogeneous requests, including both native and existing data, 
and it will be compile time uh, distributed request compilation. Again, you know, we'll, we'll, do the comp we'll do compilation with optimization will be done by each of the data managers themselves. And that will be distributed. And SQL access. In the next few slides are going to be like, can you see that slide before? The only thing different being the information that has changed in its bottoms. And, and that's, that's really the beauty of what the information network is, is that it's the same thing. The only difference is the command executor uh, and how we access that server on that environment. So in this case, if you look at SQL Access, which again was that consortium of vendors who were producing uh, uh, both uh, client uh, protocols and server protocols to talk between data managers, um, I can actually go through the command dispatcher, set, realize I have to talk to the command executor of the SQL Access. Okay, it will execute down to the host system that has that database, uh, the access to the SQL Access server, which is what that vendor has written. For example, digital will write a, a SQL Access server for RDBVMS. Oracle will write in the Oracle SQL Access Server for Oracle. HP will do it for their database. Well, IBM won't do it at all, probably. Uh, and then we get access to that SQL Access database system. So it doesn't really matter as long as that server, the SQL Access Server, has been written. We will be able, be able to gain access to that because we have written a client to it. We will be able to come that through the command executor. But, but if you look, the data, the data data manager hasn't changed. It still works the same way. Some of the consortium members, uh, R says they're a reviewer. That means what they're doing is that they're reviewing the document to make sure that it makes sense to them. And the letter P says that they're producers. It means they're either producing a client, they're producing a server, or they're producing both. Uh, in, uh, IBM isn't on here. IBM feels that SQL should be doing this and not SQL access consortium, so they don't want to have anything to do with it. <coughs> we have actually uh, been doing a lot of work on our, both our server and our client for the SQL access. And we have actually integrated with some of the other producers in this environment, and they seem to be working very well. So we're real excited about being able to use a SQL access uh, client and server um, uh, information to talk between databases. And we feel that this is really where, where the information network is going to get a lot of its own uh, access to, the, to distributed data models or distributed databases from. If you remember a picture two slides ago, Looks exactly the same, except this time the command executor is for RDBVMS or for SQL. Again, the command dispatchers talk to the command executor, which talk to the access server, which gets the data out of the database. And the database could be either database. Doesn't really matter what platform it's on. For DB2, uh, we'll use the SNA gateway through AU6.2 onto an uh, MBS system. Uh, and we have access uh, to DB2 server. Uh, since we, we don't feel that uh, DB2 is going to ever implement the SQL access server side, we decided to implement something very similar to that on the MBS, MBS system to access DB2. And later on, uh, we'll, build, we'll build a command executors for existing data managers. Uh, such as RMS, vSIM, UBMS, our network model database, so that um, we'll, we'll be able to, to integrate all of the different, a, a different model other than the relation model into this information network. That was just the server stuff. Now what about the client side of everything? Well, again, if you look at the client side, uh, what, we, what, we, what our goals are to provide a, a multi-server, I'm sorry, a multi-client environment, uh, and, and we will do that through the uniform access to all data called SQL2 that I keep talking about. Uh, so it really won't matter what the source of your tools or applications are. Um, if you're talking through the SQL2 uh, uh, environment, you'll be able to get out to, the, to, to any of the data managers through the information network. Um, if you have an existing application that's out there running, let's say that you're running something that was written completely in DSRI. Well, obviously DSRI is not SQL2, nor will it ever be. So we will have uh, emulators to allow you to, to take those existing applications that are running today and, and emulate this, we'll take that emulated SQL2 call and go to any data manager. So we're not going to kill your investment that you have put into your, your database stuff today. Uh, we're just gonna augment it by providing emulators. Uh, if you're on a desktop, 
the SQL services or SQL access to be able to take it from a client to uh, any server, and then extend the relational model for advanced applications such as true distributed environments. Now, these client platforms can also be on any platform. They can be on an OSF or an Ultrix. They can be on a Unix. They can be on an IBM. They can be on a Mac. They can be on whatever the uh, client uh, piece has been, <coughs> has been ported over to. So uh, our goals in this uniform client access to the data is again to be full SQL level one compliance. Uh, SQL2, if you haven't seen it, is well over 600 pages of you have to do this in order to get this. And it, the way that they've done is they've broken it down into uh, three different levels of compliance. So that if you have an SQL compliant version today, you will have an SQL2 compliant version tomorrow. You just won't have any of the great new features. Okay. Um, what we'll do then is that we'll extend this SQL2 uh, to implement um, implementer defined standards options, distributed database support, request structuring, performance, and RDBVMS feature equivalences. Our, our native <coughs> since our native uh, data manager is different than RDBVMS, we we'll need to make some we need to put some things in that that, uh, that data manager to make it uh, feature equivalent to RDBVMS. <coughs> In data access modes, uh, we will have a, a C language preprocessor with others to follow, probably COBOL, unfortunately, <coughs> uh, with embedded SQL. We'll provide an SQL module language, which will be the, the highly recommended way that you, um, you build your applications. Uh, if you have customers who are starting to build today with RDBVMS, I would strongly suggest that you have them look and use module language to make a role easy to move over if they need to move over in the future, because that is going to be the primary function. What we'll do with the embedded uh, SQL is that we'll run through, we'll look at, we'll find your SQL statement, we'll create an SQL module for you anyways. So you can do it yourself or you can let us do it for you. Uh, there'll be multi-statement procedures. Right now, if you look at the, the current SQL module language, each procedure is basically a single statement. We'll allow you to be able to do multi-statement procedures uh, and multi-procedural modules. We'll provide a dynamic SQL2 um, environment uh, they're doing a lot of changes in SQL2 on how Dynamic works. Right now, if you uh, use Dynamic SQL, you're using SQL DAs uh, and SQL code and all these other things that they're going to kind of push away to go to more of a messaging environment like VMS has. And then we'll also provide an interactive SQL2, which will be both character cell and Windows interface. The emulators. Um, to allow you to uh, preserve the application investments in, that you have already done, uh, and, th and therefore uh, you can still use those existing applications and tools to access the data. That's really the important part. <coughs> For SQL services, you can have you can have digital SQL services clients, and you can have non-digital SQL services clients all talking through the SQL access protocol. Once you have that SQL access protocol, you have access into the information network and as, as well as into the, the whole environment. The SQL services server okay, is, a, is a desktop um, data access environment which gives you enterprise-wide access from the desktop, reduces and eliminates the desktop database. There's no reason to have the support database on the Macintosh anymore. You can get it from anywhere in the network. And provides existing SQL services applications with full access to information network facilities. In terms of extensibility, uh, we'll be um, adding some stuff called the Application Driven Database Software, or the add stuff. Uh, initial targets for this is multimedia data handling, uh, warm environments, and stuff like that. Uh, computer, uh, SIM environment, computer integrated manufacturing, and the CALS document management. There's a, you know, there's a whole big CALS program office out there uh, who is determining how digital is going to get into this uh, uh, logistical space. And, We'll be able to put in some extensibility functions in our in our ads uh, cows environment to be able to, to take advantage of that information once it comes out. Portability. I mean, it's one of the biggest things that, that when you read in the press, the biggest thing wrong with RDB is it only runs on a proprietary line, a uh, proprietary place. And uh, and uh, some other vendors have come out and told a good story. They've told the story of 
Hey, you can run the same thing on IBM and DG and Tandem and Honeywell and HP. And I said they told a good story. But we're going to tell a better story. We're going to do it. If you look at our portability, the original platform we're going to do it is digital Unix. Uh, we'll, we'll build the whole environment. Uh, we'll do a full port to, uh, um, to a vaccine best environment and other environments. Then we'll, then we'll do some client porting to other targets, for example, OS2, where the only thing that you'll have on the client side is the command dispatcher and the, the application running. You won't really have any command executors or the, uh, the people where, the, where the execution of the data is. <coughs> so there's four different types of ports that you can do, right? You can have a client port, which means what you have to do to, to port over is to port the command dispatcher and the SQL2 language com components. And that gives, you, uh, that gives you full access to all the data in the information network. We have a server port, which is a command dispatcher, a native command executor, and the SQL2 language components. And what that gives you is local storage for all of the stuff. You can actually physically store it on your disks. The access server port, all you have to do is port uh, primarily the command dispatcher and the command executor for the data manager. And what that gives you is access to the data managed by existing data, data managers, such as the SQL access stuff or the DB2 stuff. And then the d desktop port, all you have to do is, to, uh, is primarily to port the SQL services client, which gives you desktop access um, to remote information uh, anywhere. Now, before I put this next slide up, if this gets out of the room, you're all dead, okay? These are our plans. They're in no particular order. <clears throat> we may choose to change these plans, but these are our current thinking at the time. Okay? We certainly will build uh, both the, the client and the server, and when it says client and server, we also by default uh, you have to do some mean desktop as well. So we will have both the client and server on the Ultrix OSF, on VMS, for MS-DOS, OS2, and Macintosh, we'll do only the SQL services. Current plans now. Uh, the RISC VMS, both client and server, HP, Sun OSF, uh, both SCO Unix, System, uh, System 5 Unix, MS DOS, uh, we're also thinking about doing a client. On OS2, the client, on Macintosh, the client, on the Unicos or the Cray environment, both of them, on OS2, maybe just the server, and on the AIX, both of them. Our current plans are, uh, we're obviously looking at and, and, and importing this to many, many, many platforms, uh, but it's not something that we're going to do ourselves. We may use third-party third party porting. I mean, certainly, we don't know everything about the, the, the IBM AIS environment. There may be somebody who knows better about that environment on how to build these particular parts. So we'll, we'll use porting partners to do some of that. There are no plans for IBM NPS as a client? Uh, things like that are under consideration, but right now we're not, we're not convinced. We think that, that DB2 will own the IBM NPS environment, and rather than go to the data manager or the server over there, if we can just have access to the DB2, um, we feel that that would be significant. Most IBM shops would say, hey, you're not putting that digital root stuff up there. <coughs> you know, we have a hard time with buying up the DB2, our RB access to DB2, uh, just letting us put our server on there, our CICS server up there. My customers are telling me we can't be an integrator until we can get access to RDB from applications running on NBS system. And they're very serious about that. And that's good information. I'll certainly take that back. So, a summary. That's a nice story to tell about how we're going to integrate existing data on multi computing platforms of different times. We don't care about the platform anymore. We're going to be able to manage all of them. Uh, integrates ge geographically dispersed data into a single enterprise asset. Data, data, data managers support enhanced relational data models, extensible uh, to accommodate engineering and future application data management requirements. Again, if people design, if, uh, if object oriented became the panacea that relational did a few years ago in the 80s, uh, we, we want to be able to, to also retreat from that environment as well. And then any other type of data manager may come in the future and offers application portability across the enterprise in an environment upon which you can, you can uh, uh, actually <coughs> provide applications to run anywhere. We have a short time for questions. Uh, just as a uh, just kind of
I'm curious, like everybody's been getting all these non-disclosure things all week and all that. Uh, would it be possible to get, like, since this is already an announced product, then they gave the same thing at the last seminar in uh, Nashua, like the information that we're going through that? Would it be possible to get a copy of the slides, maybe with a couple of them left out, the ones that you consider really sensible? We're, we're still working on the presentation. This is uh, this is uh, one of these things that we're you know we're, we're still trying out. There were a couple of rough things in this presentation that we want to try to screw up before we start providing what we are planning. Do you want to say anything else about that? No, I just think well, if, if there is something that you're planning, maybe uh, put it in a pointer like this when you get this fine tuned, and then send it to the uh, instant distribution. We're planning on doing that. We're planning on uh, we're building we're in the process of building a new uh, pit. Uh, for the one through the information network as well. So we're doing all those things, we're just not there yet. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, I did. Um, we'd actually like to use that as a basis for a kit. And when you uh, fill out your feedback forms or you can talk to Tracker or talk to me about it, I'd like you to think about the question of whether you think that makes a suitable strategy kit and what you'd like to see happen to it before it went into Opal for like general general distribution. Okay. <coughs> I got I got one question. It makes a really great story. I love it all the way through. But I must admit I get a little bit skeptical when we start talking about feature equivalents. Because what you're really talking about there is you're developing something specific that you're gonna have to go after and keep up with all of these other platforms. Is that not right? And there I tell you what I get real concerned. Even within our own self we can't keep up groups that are developing and sort of, you know, and we're always just a little bit behind. Whatever it is that's based on something else, we always end up a little bit behind. This means we're depending on other manufacturers, and that's really tough. The only time I said we're going to be doing equivalent stuff is with RDBPMS. Some features that, that RDBPMS has that, that, um, that we'll need to do some equivalent stuff. DB2 doesn't have, for example. And what happens when DB2 starts changing itself around? Because, I mean, they come up with all sorts of manipulations and God knows what. And there we're going to have to keep changing this driver or whatever it is. Actually, the thing we have to change is the helper server, right? Right. Well, yeah, no, I, I understand that there's, you know, the, the changes are limited. Right. But we're going to have to keep up with it. We seem to keep up with our promises. Are we not promising too much? Well, I don't, I don't think we're promising too much. I think, I think what, we're, uh, what, we're, what we're trying to accomplish is, okay, you know, it, it may be to the, the fact that Okay, some vendor may have a really neat bell and whistle that isn't imp implemented in our system yet, but is certainly things that are going to be put in. And so, yeah, maybe we'll be chasing, but we don't suspect that we'll be chasing uh, a great deal. Yeah, DB2 is really the exception to the rule because of the SQL access stuff. If they don't implement SQL access, then we have to implement our own and, and like <coughs> SQL access on the server uh, as a CICS uh, task or a part of VTown. So we have to do that. Um, but but other I'm, than that. I'm with you if we, if we can do it. I'm just, uh, as I say, I get a little skeptical when I see us chasing will of the wisps that other manufacturers are, in fact, you know, are up to their whims to follow. And I don't like that. If, if, they, um, if they do something that's like directly opposed to the way um, like SQL defines things, then we'll probably stick with the way SQL does things. That's, that's, a good, that's good information uh, to take back. And, Yes. So maybe more of a suggestion. Um, like one of the things I think like the key things for the 90s, is, as you pointed out, is information. But the second part is what this uh, week is about like, and service slash support of that information. And you know, so we've got two key strategies there for the 90s. And I think this is really good for the information side of it. And the other side of it is the service side of it, which we're doing this week. But I haven't seen a lot of discussions about, you know, in uh, literature and that, like, putting the two things together, like, here's our answer to your information needs, and here's how we're going to support it on the service side. You know, like, putting the two models uh, in the same package, the customer attention. The service being? Well, the data center management uh, of that, the databases, you know, like, uh, uh, putting the two packages together somehow. Understood. There is a session this afternoon on uh, managing databases and data center. Yeah. No, I just see what I'm just saying is like uh, uh, CEO level, he's kind of concerned about the information. I know that he has to deal with, you know, and he also needs to be concerned about the support of it. And we've got the information.
information that we've modeled up. We're going to be giving you here's how we do your information. And then in a separate handout somewhere else, you know, some other literature, we're going to say, here's your data center administration. Here's how we're going to do that. We're not doing it together. So you know, good. Okay. Good point. Any other questions? What if another platform comes, say, two years down the line? Would you be looking at seeing ways to integrate that into your uh, uh, system right now? If, um, if, if, if a new, new platform was created in the, in the next year, nobody knew about it today, and uh, every, every company went out and bought 25 of them, well, certainly we could look at what, what does it mean to, to do a server report and a client report um, to that environment. And so, I mean, that, that's the, really the beauty of what the information network is, that we have things so broken up that there's only certain sections that you have to support in order to be able to do those types of things and to port for example, um, the server part, so you have to you have to port you know, command dispatcher and, and a couple other things, and you're there. So I mean, yeah, it, it, I, I'd say it, it's really simple. Yeah, in the next two weeks we can do it. Maybe in the next year we can get some done on that. But uh, but it, 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 it means because of the way we're building that the, the whole database system and the whole information network that it becomes easier to port, and that's really the goal. I think we might be missing the market on the IBM mid range. Lots of people out there with isolated AS 400s or whatever. Uh, we have, if we had good products that they could integrate theirs into our strategy, such as you know services for AS 400s, I, I think we would have a good story to tell and give them an optional roadmap. These AS 400 customers don't necessarily want to buy a 3090. Okay, well, sort of hit that back. Any others? Okay, thank you very much for coming. I guess there's a break now until 2.30, so.